we have three witnesses who have just given sworn affidavits that says that he did have a relationship, a sexual relationship with my wife before I was convicted. And he went into court and said he didn't. Now, who are you going to believe, him or the three people? Or are you going to say these three people are lying? They saw that personally. They witnessed Schwartz having sexual contact with my wife, romancing, uh, smooching in the back of a car. Uh, my sister and William Lane saw it approximately the same day, and then David Rogers saw it on a separate I day. I suppose Schwartz was thinking in terms of, well, this is 20 years ago. Nobody's going to want to get involved in this anyway, and I'll just lie and get out of it. But uh, three people actually have given the affidavits. I think Sandra probably has copies of them. She'll give them to you. The, the judge in Palm Beach, Judge Payne, has to tell the magistrate to uh, issue an order to bring all the people together so that they can make the testimony. See, when Schwartz went down there, when we went down there last year at this time, Schwartz said, no, I never had a relationship with this man's wife until after he was in prison, which was a lie, all right? So then the three people came after he gave the testimony mm -hmm. and gave the affidavits. Now that's new evidence that shows that the state's witness in chief is a perjurer, which is a felony. So Schwartz has committed a felony before the United States District Court. So it's just not a question of a civil matter, it's a question of a criminal matter. And we have filed with the United States Attorney's Office in Miami, that's Dexter Langton, a criminal complaint against Schwartz. And they have taken this and they are doing their own investigation at this time has Schwartz, an officer of the court, committed perjury. And according to the three uh, affidavits, that is legally sufficient to prove the perjury. You need, in Florida law, you need two affidavits to prove a perjury. You just can't come in and say the man's lying. You need witnesses, mm -hmm. and they have to swear under oath. So now you have a choice. You have, you can believe Mr. Schwartz, or you can believe the three people who are filing under oath their own testimony saying, yes, he was having a sexual relationship with Schaefer's wife. Now, if these people are shown to be lying, then they are subject to perjury and five years in the joint for lying under uh, sworn affidavits. So you've got three swearing here and you've got one swearing there. Now, they have to, uh, legally speaking, the court has to bring these people together and take the testimony and make a determination on who's telling the truth. And that will be up to the magistrate. And that's where we stand as to when they will be coming in and saying, testifying under oath and going up and being cross-examined, what did you see exactly? Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't there personally, so I don't know what they saw exactly. But they did see that he was having a sexual relationship with my wife before the trial started was the girlfriend of the trial judge her name is Pat Quinna, and now it's Pat Quinna Trowbridge because she married him, came to me in the jail approximately August or September of 1973 and told me that my wife and my lawyer were having an affair and that I was going to be convicted and sent to prison. And I said, no, listen, I can prove because I have this document that shows that the state's witness in chief is lying. Mm -hmm. Those people were never in my car. They never copied down my license number because here is the proof. When you check a license tag, you know, and they put it in the computer, it comes back to the certain address. Well, the address that it should have come back to was in Fort Lauderdale if they had done it. But they never did that. See, they just said, yes, we did it, and we tracked it to this man's in Stewart. home but my in Stewart but my car wasn't registered there. You drive up to my home, and I copy your license number down. And then I go to the police, and I say, I copied this man's tag number down. Here's the tag number. And they run the tag through their computer. It's going to go to a certain address, right? Well, the address that it should have gone was my Fort Lauderdale address, because that's where my car was registered. It was not registered in Martin County, which is 100 miles away from Fort Lauderdale. Yet. The testimony of this woman is that she copied down my license number, gave it to the police, the police ran the tag, and they gave her the Martin County address. 
It just is not true, see? And I could prove it wasn't true because I had it in my pocket and I gave it to Schwartz. I said, here's the document. She's not telling the truth. Find out who told her to tell this story. Somebody had to tell her. Say this, lady. And they searched the home. They took my, my literary work and they said, oh yes, this man writes lurid fiction, therefore he's a killer. But it had nothing whatsoever to do with those people who were killed. Nothing that belonged to the women who I am convicted of killing was found at any search. That is the myth, okay? Yes, we went to Schaefer's home. Yes, we conducted a search. Yes, we found this evidence that links him to this one and that one and the one he's convicted for. But when you get down to the facts, it does, that's a lie. There is nothing there. I am not linked to those people in any way except by the testimony of that woman that says, I copied down the license number, we checked it, and it went right to his home in Stewart. That's, that's the link. That's why it's so important. And when I gave the document to Schwartz and they changed it by trial time, it was showing that my car was registered to Stewart, where it never had been registered before. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's the connection. There's a lot of myth that goes on where they will tell you, like, yes, he's been in court 17 times. Yes, I filed 17 times, and they just throw it out, see? Mm -hmm. And that, that leads you to believe that I've had judicial review under proper conditions where an inquiry has been made, but that has never been done until this time. That's why I was allowed in the federal court. The judge looked at it. He says, nobody has ever met, examined this stuff. What are you telling me? He's filed 17 times? Sure, yeah, sure he has. How come nobody ever looked at it? He keeps saying the same thing over and over. They framed me. That's what I'm saying. And it was through the uh, miscegenations of my trial attorney who asked my wife to marry him right after I was convicted. Are you going to believe that there was nothing going on, that I was convicted and the same day I was convicted, hey, let's get married, Mrs. Schaefer. There was no romance? Come on, man, you know, give me a break, right? And then didn't tell me, oh, and she agreed to marry him. The trial attorney asked the wife of the defendant to marry him within 24 hours of the conviction and she agrees to it and there's no romance prior to the trial? You know, that's not even rational. You know, nobody does that. And then didn't even tell me about it for six, uh, how long was it? Almost, I guess, eight weeks. Never told me, I asked your wife to marry me and she agreed to marry me and uh, the relationship here has changed. You know, I wasn't told for two months that this even was going on after I was convicted, much less before I was it convicted. Was the only person who told me about it before I was convicted was... And uh, they were the runaways. Was everything was, on, everything was proper and done according to the book, except I wanted to give them a scare. They laughed. They thought it was a joke. Well, according, because of the Son of Sam law, I'm not allowed to discuss that with the media. Eventually, I, I made a legal, a legal arrest and I abused the prisoners. They were not raped or sexually assaulted or anything like that. I told them that they were leaving themselves open to be murdered, uh, abused, and all that, running away with no money, and no visible means of support. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna make a living? And they just laughed, you know? You're gonna sell drugs, you're gonna sell pussy, what are you gonna do? You gotta put, put food in your mouth. And I said, well, they, they, ha, 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 you know, we'll just get along. I said, yeah, you'll get along, you'll wind up in a ditch, you know, in my jurisdiction, and then I'll have to pick up the pieces. And I said, show you how easy it would be, you know. Here you are under arrest. I know a guy who buy a young girl. Hell, uh, I know five or six of them that would buy a young girl and make her, make her into a whore. I mean, this is nothing new. Oh, yeah, ha, 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 ha. You think it's so funny? Well, we'll just tie you over here to this tree, and we'll tie you over to this tree, and I'll leave, and I'll bring somebody back and sell you. Well, I didn't. I, did, I tied them to the tree, but uh, I didn't go and get anybody and sell them. I just wanted to give them a scare. And, of course, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to impress on them the dangerousness of their situation, running around. They were nice kids. You know, I didn't want to see them end up in a ditch. And I was wrong, and I paid the price. And I pleaded guilty. I felt guilty. I gave them each a written apology. What else can I do, you know? <laughs>
if I did something to you and I hurt you and, and caused you pain, then I have to say, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry I did it. And I am sorry, and I was sorry, and I apologized. I pled guilty, and that was the end of it. I fought. <laughs> it's, never, it's never the end of it. While you were working in which job? I was a, a deputy with Martin County when that happened. But see, they've tried to distort that. They've tried to say, well, that was an illegal arrest. And it was. It was a legal arrest. In fact, they sued. Do you want to wait? They sued the county for the, uh, I, I haven't seen a copy of the suit, but they did win a judgment against the county for what I did, which was abuse them while they were in my custody, legally in my custody. Not I picked them up and drove them to a remote area and tried to rape them or anything like that often gets distorted, you know. No, because I, they, I had a responsibility to make sure that they were safe and taken, taken to the, uh, the jail and processed properly and returned to their parents. And when I made the arrest, it was my responsibility to make sure from, the, from point A to point B of the jail and nothing in between. And I fucked it up. I blew it. You know, it happens, right? <laughs> and uh, because of that, I have suffered enormously. I lost my career, went to jail, got a felony on my record, but there was no evil intent. The intent was to impress on them that they could end up dead, which was true. But, you know, they suffered no physical harm. It was an emotional intimidation type of a thing. And it gave them a good scare, <laughs> no doubt about that. But it was valid, wrong, wrong. I'm not saying what I did was right, but they were valid. I bet you they don't hitchhike anymore. <laughs> well, of course, the sheriff, when, when I called my superior and I said, I have the two prisoners and they've run away, right? <laughs> And they're in handcuffs. We just got to go out and get them. And they told, then they told my uh, superior what the circumstances were. Then he called the sheriff. And the sheriff said, whoa, this is, you know, you're way over the line here, Jack. And I uh, said, so, yeah, I guess I am. And that's when I was charged with aggravated assault, which is assault without intent to kill or inflict serious bodily harm. It goes beyond verbal, but it goes beyond deadly. I mean, it goes short of deadly, but beyond verbal. Well, I started out working as an investigator with Wackenhut Corporation, doing industrial investigations into thefts and things like that. And then I went and got my uh, degree in criminal justice and joined the uh, Municipal Police Department at Wilton Manors. And with small police departments, you don't go, you don't get uh, promoted very fast. You know, it's kind of a small town type of thing and you stay a sergeant for 20 years. And in order to move up, you have to get with a larger department. So, so I moved, moved up to Martin County. Well, it was interesting. I got, I got, was a probationary pr patrolman, okay? And because I had been in the academy and had a degree in criminal justice and I had, um, the dean's list, I was an honored student, I got a letter from the Fort Lauderdale Police Department asking me to come for an interview. And at that time, I had just had a bad experience with my captain, a man by the name of Captain Saxon, where I had written some tickets that were very valid tickets, and he made arrangements for a side payment. You know, go in and see the captain, and, and the captain takes care of it, and you pay your fine direct, and it doesn't go on your record, and you don't get points and all that. And uh, this pissed me off because this one particular one was a woman who worked in the courthouse and she had almost caused an accident and she deserved to get a ticket. And because she worked in the courthouse and she knew the captain, everything was cooled. And shortly after that, I got a letter from Fort Lauderdale Police Department asking me to come in for an interview, better pay, better advancement. You know, the, what they're doing is stealing from the small departments. And I went and I saw uh, Captain Sherlock and Sherlock says, well, you work over with uh, Bernard Scott. He says, I know Bernie, and why do you want to leave there? I said, well, I didn't want to leave there until just recently. I got your letter, and, and this is what happened with Captain Saxon. And I told him, I said, I feel this is uh, wrong. I don't want to be involved with a, a department 
that goes in for this sort of thing, even though we all know they do it, I'd rather not be involved in this. And he called Scott on the phone, told me what I told him. And because I was a probationary patrolman, Scott said, well, you're not working out here. We'll just get rid of you now. You don't want to play games with the big boys. You know, you don't have a proper understanding of police work and all that. So it wasn't that anything that I did overtly. It was just trying to get, up, get around becoming involved in small town corruption. Mm -hmm. is, and it's the kind of thing that goes on in Georgia a lot, I imagine, with the speed traps and all that, where you go through a little town and they give you a ticket and you go in and you see the chief and you pay in cash and you're on your way. That happens in Georgia, I understand, a lot. <laughs> Florida, too. <laughs> Martin County was a situation where my wife's uh, brother was with the highway patrol. And the sheriff of Martin County, a man by the name of Baker, had been removed from office by the governor. Well, they, they had an opening up there because they fired about half the deputies for corruption, with, along with the sheriff and all his gang, right? And the, the uh, governor appointed a new man by the name of Crowder as the sheriff, and he had a desperate need for people. And uh, Henry Dean said, well, my brother-in-law just left Wilton Matters, you know, he didn't want to get involved in this corruption. Why don't you go up and hire on with Martin County? So my wife got to transfer her job with Florida Power and Light, and I went up and got the my job. My psychological, um, thought I'm perfectly healthy, mentally healthy, and normal in every way. There's nothing wrong with me except my environment. You know, living in a prison environment causes a lot of stress. But I've done administrative multi-phase personality inventory and uh, all the ones they give you. And the most recent one was in uh, 1990, and I'm uh, mentally emotionally healthy and psychologically healthy. I have a psych one, which is the best you can have. No problems whatsoever. And haven't had any since I've been in. But Sandra can give you a copy of the report okay. by Francis Miller. Shambly is where uh, I, Shambly, I lived in Nashville, but as where uh, I, I lived in Nashville, but we moved to Georgia. You lived in Sexton Woods, which is off of Peach Peachtree, I guess, the big street. And I went to Sexton Woods Elementary School, and then I went to Our Lady of the Assumption, and then I went to Marist for uh, the beginning of my first year of high school. But then we moved to Florida. But uh, you know, I grew up in the Catholic in the Catholic school in uh, Assumption, and uh, played league ball with the Catholic League in Atlanta in 1950. Uh, 58, 59, 50, and 60, and would have gone to Marist Military School with all the other guys from Assumption. They either went to Pius X or Marist, that's all you went to. And uh, then we moved down here and I went to the Catholic school. Did all the normal things, uh, mostly sports, you know. Catholics are, uh, Catholics are very big on sports, you know. Ba uh, basketball and football, especially in the Catholic League. I don't know what it's like now in Atlanta, but back then, it was you had the private school circuit mm -hmm. where all the different private schools had their own league and we played Westminster and uh, all the different you know private Catholic schools and private uh, Christian <laughs> schools. Well that's, that was my thing, I was a golfer. I played at Chastain Park and I was at Chastain Park when I wasn't, when I wasn't doing anything else, I was at Chastain Park hitting the golf balls mm -hmm. and hunting and fishing at the Murphy Candler. They made that into a park, but before it was a park, that's when I lived there, and they had the lake, and you could go up there and shoot the 22s and uh, fish for, for brim and bass in the Murphy Candler Park Lake. And I'd sneak on Peachtree Country Club and uh, fish in their lakes, you know. <laughs> Stuff kids do. Mm -hmm. but, uh, in Atlanta, it was, it's like when you're going into uh, puberty and you start discovering about sports and you get into this male bonding thing, and we're on the basketball team, I was a starter and I was on the football team, I was an end, and golf was coming up for high school, and I had to get out there and get ready to be on the golf team. You know, and uh, Atlanta had a good golf, golf program. Junior golf has always been big in Atlanta. My father worked for Kimberly Clark Corporation, paper manufacturer. He's a, he was a salesman for them, and uh, everything was fine. Well, Sexton Woods is not like a low-class area, you know. My dad was a good salesman one of their best. I was, I'm the eldest brother sister, and I have a younger brother. Family of three, mom and dad and the dogs. I'm to get to know the family Went to work, a nine to fiver, working for, uh, working for Kimberly Clark in downtown Atlanta. 
and occasionally being on the road, you know, as sales meetings and that. And, you know, going to Catholic school and coming home and doing your homework and doing sports, going up to the lake. Um, what's the big lake? Up there? No, I didn't have an abused childhood or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, regularly good, and, good uh, childhood. Parents... I didn't even know what marijuana was until I got into university. My parents were very strict, straight up Catholics. I mean, Catholic school, mass every morning, mass on the, on the weekends, you go to Sunday church, you don't do anything before you go to church. You know, straight up Catholics, they were uh, Catholics before they got married, they got married as Catholics and they raised as Catholics. And you know, Catholics see everything sort of like black and white. The sin is over here and the, and the correctness is over here and there's no gray area in between. That's how Catholics are. And of course, growing up that way and being in the Catholic elementary school and the Catholic uh, high school, I had a very, very black and white view of the world, what's right and what's wrong. And I didn't uh, learn to equivocate before, until I got to the university for gray areas. <laughs> but that's how I was raised. I was raised very strictly in the Catholic Church. In fact, when I came down here, I almost went to the St. John Vianney Seminary and became a priest. I was that close to becoming a priest. Yeah, I had some problems with, Catholic, with the Catholic Church's structure. It's too dogmatic, and uh, they don't invite you to question the dogma. And I'm a questioning, sensitive person. I, I'm a creative person, and I have a good imagination and a good mind. I want to be able to go to the priest and say, what's the story on this? You know, virgin birth, right? How do you explain this? What's the story? What's, give me some books to read about this. And they don't want to hear it. They say, whoa, you know. Okay. <laughs> and that's how I come I didn't go. I went to, I had a golf age scholarship. 12 and 13 and 14, that age right in there, 11 to 14. <laughs> the first kiss was uh, with, with, at a high school dance in Fort Lauderdale. I remember it very well, out underneath the ficus tree. I can even tell you what she was wearing. <laughs> it was lovely. She was one of the girls at the uh -huh. Catholic school. But as far as, you know, having, uh, sex, you know, you didn't, there was none of this sexual stuff like that goes on in the, in the schools today and everybody's, you know, wearing little brief costumes and everything. You didn't see that back in 1961 and 62. I had good experiences. I went, in fact, when Kathy Wrightson, uh, the first kiss, I, I went steady with her all the way through high school. So until I was out of high school, I only dated one girl. Well, the regular petting that anybody does when you're in high school, you know, okay. kissing and petting. But as far as sexual intercourse, no, not in high school. That's telling tales out of school, isn't it? That, that wouldn't be very nice to put somebody's name like that into a, like that, who was sexually repressed and could not in, enjoy uh, a normal, intimate relationship. Okay. But, you know, that's, uh, that's how people are, and especially in uh, some girls that are brought up in very strict Catholic uh, schools, I found out that are so repressed sexually that they just have to feel as though that they've been forced into it and can't say, they say no, and you just have to say yes, you know, and you have to be forceful and persistent, and then they say, oh, I'm overwhelmed, you know, and that's how they rationalize it away. Well, I'm more of a romantic romantic type and I like uh, moonlight and, and flowers and, and romance and that sort of um, this was this was beyond my experience I didn't understand it at the time later when I went to the university and I studied abnormal psychology I began to understand that there are people who are uh, not sexually the way that that normal people oh, are, like I say, normal. I don't know how I am. I'm a romantic, okay. and but other people aren't. And apparently, she needed that kind of uh, forcefulness of personality to make it okay for her. It wasn't like she went home bruised and bleeding or anything like that. You know, it's a scenario, but a role playing, I guess, is what you call. It. And probably what they do with sexual surrogates today officially if you've got some problem and they meet you up with somebody and you role play it out. Apparently this is a big business out there. I don't know what they do out there now. I've been in 20 years. Oh, Lee, is she thinking of undressing in front of the window? 
Well, she was another girl. She went to Stranahan, and I went to St. Thomas, and uh, Stranahan is a secular high school. And she was more uh, liberated, you know, and uh, she got off on uh, doing her little strip tease in front of the, her window at night for myself and Pete Maddock and Topper Keith and the boys of the neighborhood, right? And she was entertaining. And I always felt that was kind of uh, slutty, you know? <laughs> So that's not the way that uh, good Catholic girls behave. It, it, she wasn't a Catholic girl. She was brought up in a different system, and uh, she was uh, trying to attract male attention. Her name was Lee Hainline. Well, naturally, I get turned on just like everybody else, because mostly it was a, a group thing. All the guys are over, we're playing cards or watching TV or whatever, you know. And Lee, we'd say, oh, it's getting about 10 o'clock. Lee be up in the window, you know. <laughs> we'd go out in the yard and watch. You know, I'm not, I'm not judgmental. I went over to Lee's house and made a move on her. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously she was up there dancing around uh, looking for some attention. I think I gave her attention. I went up and uh, she invited me right up to the bedroom. I had a good time with Lee. I was in college when I was with Senator Long. She was in high school, but I was in college. I met her, <clears throat> I met her at a high school dance. And I was at the dance with a girl by the name of Dee Cunningham. And I looked over there and I saw Sandra and she was sitting there. And I, she looked awfully familiar. And I went up to her and I said, uh, don't I know you from somewhere? <laughs> this is a great opening line, right? But I just had to do it. I was compelled. I just knew her from somewhere, it seemed like. And she said, no, I don't think so, you know. <laughs> well, eventually I found out what her name was. I asked somebody what her name was, that it was Sandy Stewart. And I went home. And I, and I looked in the phone book, and I went down the Stewarts, and I went through every S-T-U-A-R-T -T trying to find it, and every S-T-E-W-A-R-T -T trying to find it. And finally, I tracked her down. I think I asked one of the guys who went to Stranahan, you know. But uh, I called her up, and I got a date, man. You know, I'm not bashful. If I like them, I call them up and say, let's go out. And that's what I did with her. And we hit it off very well. And... Uh, we went steady for about a year. A lovely relationship. That's right, around the end of 65, maybe September or so, because she was going off to New College, and I was staying at the college where I went here in, in Florida. New College is on the other side of the state. So we broke it off. No, she was going away to school, and uh, there's no, you can't go steady when somebody's in uh, Tampa and you're in Fort Lauderdale. It was very amicable. It's that we had a great time together, and it's time to move on, on. Uh, you know, complicate things by trying to remain steadies. But there was no animosity mm -hmm. or anything like that. I was hurt, naturally, you know, because I take a much deeper interest in my relationships. Sandy's, uh, she's uh, flighty and superficial in her relationships, and she moves around, chung, 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 bounces around from one to another, whereas I'm a one-man uh, one woman type of person because that's the way that I was raised and trained in the Catholic Church. I always blame it on the Catholic Church, just like Frank Zappa and every other Catholic guy that gets hooked into this one man relationship. He said, yeah, I've got to blame it on the nuns and the priests because that's what they taught us. And uh, I was just not taught to be promiscuous. If you had a relationship that was emotional and sexual with somebody, it was a commitment and you made a commitment to them, and uh, you were their friend and their lover, and uh, you didn't. If you had a relationship that was emotional and sexual with somebody, it was a commitment, and you made a commitment to them, and uh, you were their friend and their lover, and uh, you didn't stray, you know? <laughs> Here's what happened. They accused me of killing 34 people in the newspaper, all right? Imagine yourself waking up some morning and seeing your picture on the front page with being accused of 34 murders. It is absolutely devastating. And you're thinking to yourself, is it possible that I could have done this and that I don't know? Because I don't have any recollection of uh, killing 34 people. That's what you're going to say if you didn't do it, right? And people are saying, yes, you did. We can prove it, rah, 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 rah. You say, well, I must be crazy because I don't even remember any of that. So that's why Baker acted 
you know, that put me in a, up the Chattahoochee to find out if that there was something wrong with my, with my brain, like a, a lesion or something that caused me to kill people and have a blackout and not remember it, right? This was the whole purpose of going up there. Well, I walked in the door and I went to see the intake a doctor, whoever it was, and he says, uh, oh, you're the guy who killed the 34 women. How do you feel about that? I thought, wow, you know, this isn't, this isn't a situation where I'm going up to find out. This is a situation where it's going to be an interrogation and they're going to, uh, whatever I say, is, uh, th this is not going to be for medical purposes at all. This is like talking to the state attorney's office. The worst thing he could have possibly done was say that because then I said to myself, well, they want stories? I'll give them stories. Oh, gave him lots of stories. Nothing had to do with any murders. Told him everything I could think of and went and talked to the bugs on the wing and tried to find some more stories to tell him. I told him all kinds of stories. But nothing that had to do, that implicated me in any crimes. I certainly not implicated myself in any murders. But I had the presence of mind to understand what they were up to. And then, the same day, they threw me in a solitary confinement unbelievable filth on the floor and I was held for two weeks in the most incredible dungeon that you had ever imagined with with lunatics drooling fucking lunatics well I realized later that this was in order to break me down to destroy me you know mentally to bring me to my knees and to make me malleable that I would say and do whatever they wanted me to do Having been through the system one time, you realize the tricks of their trade that they use to break people. And that that's what they were doing to me. They weren't interested in whether I had blackouts. They wanted me to make an inculpatory statement. And I didn't have anything to say. I didn't kill anybody. Especially, and I said, well, who are these 34 people? I said, well, we don't have to give you the names. I said, well, yeah, woo. I think if you're going to accuse me of killing 34 people, I'd like to have some names and some dates and some uh, MOs and things like that. It took me until 1981 to get the names of the people who they thought that I killed. And when I got those names, he finally reduced it, S Robert Stone and Lem Brumley. Lem Brumley, who was later arrested as a racketeer for the narcotics, okay, and pled guilty. Stone eventually was confronted by a, uh, a reporter by the name of Barbara, was supposed to be dead. So she went to Stone and he reduced it from 34 to 9, okay, and gave her the names. And I went and took those names in those jurisdictions and I wrote to the police departments or the sheriff's departments in those jurisdictions and I said, I understand I'm the, I am the, uh, suspect in this crime, and uh, I want to uh, take polygraph, I want to be interviewed, I want the whole nine yards, I want an attorney, blah, blah, blah. And I went through all nine of them and ended up getting letters from every one saying that they have, that I have cooperated and that, uh, that they have given me whatever tests they wanted to give me and that I am no longer a suspect. And I, Sandra's got that stuff. I've asked her to give it to, give it to uh, people like yourself where I've, she's got copies of the letters from each state attorney's office clearing me as a suspect because of my cooperation. And the latest one that we did was the FBI. Mr. Hazelwood wrote a letter and said, you are not on our list as being a serial killer. This is Robert Stone and his little cabal down there saying, yeah, that man's a serial killer. Say, so, yeah, but you've never linked me to a crime scene, Mr. Stone. When am I going to be linked to a crime scene? You can call me whatever you want to call me, but let's see some evidence. Sandra called him on the phone and said, uh, you've accused the man of having sex with corpses. Do you have some, uh, something to back that up? I was furious, man. Can you imagine a Catholic boy raised in a Catholic school and being accused of having sex with a dead body on the front page of a newspaper? Outrageous. Makes me mad just talking about it. 
And she says, well, I'll call him and ask him. And she calls him on the phone and says, uh, well, you've accused the man of necrophilia here in this news article. Uh, what is your proof? What do you base this on? He says, well, he wrote stories. He's written it all up in fiction. He must be doing it. I said, duh. That's supposed to be the evidence. My book is supposed to be the evidence. Clean. You see, this, this is Sandra again. Here's, how, here's what, Sandra is interested in making money. Okay, that's her primary motive in life, is generating money for her. When she wrote to me, her, her, she was not interested in me, how are you doing? Gee, it's been a long time, would you like to get back together again? It's, do you still write those stories? Because I was writing back in 1965. In fact, my instructor in 1965 was Harry here I'm telling you the pitch. So when I find out that Sandra wants to make money, I say, yeah, I write it. And boy, do I ever, you know, and killer fiction shows that I'm a writer. All right. And then she says, well, what if the same question you're giving me? What if you uh, never get out? Blah, 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 you know? I said, well, we'll just write up a story like uh, Donald Evans would just say, yeah, everything they said is true. I killed 34. We'll write it up as first person account. I said, boy, you can make a lot of money selling that and it won't make any difference because I won't be able to get it getting out anyway, see? And that's where that's coming from. All that is is a, a, a business decision, more or less. There's no evidence I killed anybody. And then she started coming on with uh, this thing from they framed uh, me for Zebra. Murder. Mr. Schwartz. They framed me for murder. Framed me. Mr. Schwartz. Framed me. To get my wife. And he did this with the with the assistance of Mr. Stone. And Bruce Colton, who is the state attorney, he is well aware of it. Oh, I was, I was guilty of that. What can I say? You know, I went in, I, there was no trying to wiggle out of that. I, I, I didn't. Just a little bit too many ha Dirty Harry movies for me, you know. <laughs> you get, you get, you get to see this stuff on TV and they do all this weird stuff and then you do it in real life. It isn't like that at all. Of course there was a trunk. There was two trunks. It was filled up with my literary work. They, hundreds and hundreds, ten years worth. Not, I was not there, okay? I was not there. I have been told that they have found stuff like this, all right? I have asked Sandra. I said, you go and you see it. Eyeball it. I said, because every time that I have asked to see it, nobody knows anything about it, all right? If you're saying that you found this and that in my house, I have a right to see it. Don't I have a right to see it? Produce it. This I deny that it exists. I'm not denying they say that they found this stuff, and I'm sure that they found jewelry in my, in my house because they went and they searched my sister's bedroom. And they took the jewelry out of my sister's bedroom, not out of my bedroom and not out of my trunk, out of my sister's jewelry box, out of my sister's drawers. My, my brother's girlfriend, Sandra Moses, they took, they, they took her clothes and they said, we found the clothes of women. It belonged to Sandy Moses, you know? It was stuff that, 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 that Sandy said, oh, that's mine, you know, but. Your sister. No, Sandy Moses was my, my brother's girlfriend, okay? They go, here, they've got a list, a search warrant. They've got certain things on the search warrant they're looking for. They didn't find anything that was on the warrant that they were looking for. They took thousands of items out of the home. They just went in, we'll take this, we'll take clothes, we'll take jewelry. Look, look at this, this is uh, stories. We'll take these stories, we'll take these guns. Wow, this is no way to do a search warrant. This is a, this is a, what they call home invasion under color of state law, you know? There's laws against this kind of thing. You want to be a cop? You want to go in and look for something that belongs to Susan Place? Fine, go and look. If you find something that belongs to Susan Place, take it. But don't take everything that's ever been belonged to my family and say, and not only my family, but the, all the guys that spent the night with, my, with me, you know, uh, as, as young kids, and all the girls that spent the night with my sister, and had their parties and all the people who have been in that house for 10, 15, 20 years and left junk laying around and say, oh yeah, well this belongs to uh, this one. And we'll, we'll, he's got, oh, it just makes me so mad because. 
When they say that they found all this stuff in my home, they didn't find it in my home. They found it at my mother's home, okay? That's and I've never seen it, all right? Saying they keep adding stuff, and I keep taking the sounder. I said, look, they say they've got this and they've got that. Go down to Broward County Sheriff's Department, because that's who did the search. And I said, ask to see it. I know lots of serial killers in here, and I don't know of any of them that are denying it. The latest one, Donald Evans, he can't shut him up. He's got, he's got Ev Evans got, got bodies all over taking people on tours. Ted Bundy was the same way. The closer he got to the, to the chair, and he wasn't denying it, except officially he was denying it. But when he was talking to, to, to people like myself and to psychologists and to writers, he wasn't denying it. He was just saying, hey, I've got a thing in court. I can't go ahead and admit this and, because of my court thing. Jerry Stano was the same way. He's, he took him when he killed 40 women. He took him and showed him the bodies. Bernard Giles, he's another one. He's having sex with the corpses, like Ted Bundy was having sex with the corpses. Caught him with a fucking rotten body right there. He didn't deny anything. He pled guilty. Uh, these guys, Otis Tool. I talked to him this morning. Otis doesn't deny anything. Otis says, yeah. He says, he says Henry Lucas is lying. That's Henry cool. Lucas and I went out and we killed over 100 people Otis together, and he's cool. trying to say that, no, that it never happened. It happened. Otis doesn't deny Otis. anything. Otis says, yeah. He says, he says Henry Lucas is lying. That's Henry cool. Lucas and I went out and we killed over 100 people together, and he's trying to say that, no, that it never happened. It happened. I admit it happened. Be in prison from 27 years old until you're 75 years old and then go on the street? Forget it. You know, no, I don't want to deal with the stress. That's my personal, I would, I would not take it. I make a life for myself in here. I, I do make a life for myself in here. I do the best I can with what I've got. And uh, don't, you're not gonna put me back on the street in 2016, because I ain't going. <laughs> and that's, that's the reality of that. It's yeah, a big deal, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna make a living? You know, live under a bridge with the rest of the homeless people? You know, I read the paper. No, not for me. I got a nice little cell. I got a bed. I got coffee. I don't have very many needs. Uh, as long as I've got books and I have access to a library, I will be intellectually stimulated. And I don't want to leave. Not, not at 2016. Now you come in tomorrow and say, hey, you can, I still have a chance at 45 years old to make something out of my life. And I have told those cops and the state attorneys and everybody else, I said, connect me to any crime, any murder, anywhere, and convince me that I'm involved in, and I'll plead guilty, just like I pled guilty. When I was guilty, I pled guilty. I said, but don't make this shit up and come in here and say, yeah, you're a serial killer. Yeah, we suspect this, and yeah, we've got that. And I say, oh, you've got that? Show me. And they don't have it. The diary, the great death diary that they said they had, I've sent all kinds of people looking for the diary. It does not exist. It's a figment of Robert Stone's imagination. Okay? So, and I'll make that statement right to your camera. Any of you cops out there think that I am involved in any crime in your jurisdiction, come to me. I will take a polygraph. I will take the test. You can take my fingerprints, whatever you want to do. I'll cooperate. But have something. Don't say, you're a serial killer. You know, anybody can say that. Back it up. And they haven't done that, not even with the ones that they convicted me of. They got false evidence. They've got all kinds of evidence they collected at that crime scene to, that shows somebody else did it. I'm not super intelligent. I'm just a regular. If you look on my, um, what are those tests they give you that shows your intelligence IQ. quad? IQ test, right? I just have a regular IQ test. I'm not one of these super uh, Mensa types like Bundy was and several of these guys that are like the Mensa killer, you know, they've heard of him. But I'm just a regular guy. They can't prove it because I didn't do it is why. They've got evidence that it, it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's like the, 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 the great purse, my bullet pouch, okay? Full of bullets. Henry Dean, Elton Schwartz's current brother-in-law, goes to my home, steals it, takes it to the police department, his buddy, David Yurchuk, his former partner, and says, listen, Yurchuk, this is probably uh, evidence in one of your cases. 
Okay. Now I have the receipt where I, where, where I wrote the letter from Morocco about the purchase, which I didn't have back in 72. Okay. So, but they say, oh, this girl carried her marijuana in this purse. I said, now how? Test it. Open it up. Because if you put marijuana in a leather pouch, you're going to have residue, right? You can't put marijuana in a leather pouch and not have residue. They tested it. No residue. No residue. It wasn't hers. It was mine. They stole that out of my house. It's wrong. Yeah. There's what, 25,000 murders in this country last year, something like that? It's epidemic. It's out of control. You know, that's scary. And it's in here, too. You get murdered in here, too. There's been murders this year right in, right in this building. And uh, just because you're in prison doesn't mean that you're uh, immune from this. This is taking things out of context, all right? This story... This, this is part of actual fantasies, all right? Now, what, they, what this was, when, when I was in high school, there was a man by the name of Herschel Gordon Lewis who made films, and he made a film called Blood Feast. And I was very taken with Blood Feast. And I thought, it's so campy. It's so uh, immature. Imagine what we could do here if we had a real, real scary person, not Fuad Ramses, who is, you know, going to run around and, and, and pretend. He wasn't believable. This was written during the, the 60s when I was putting together this character. And when the police went into my home, I had, I had put all this aside when I got married, say, and I just had it in storage. But this was what came out of Blood Feast, out of my watching it and studying it. And I said, this guy, Lewis, is making a million dollars with this character. I can write this well. Mm -hmm. And I said, I started putting it together. This took years. I and mean, this just wasn't I just did it in one day. This was a product of years. Now, there were all parts. There was a, there was a pile of paper that high that had to do with this, this area right here, that I did exhaustive studies, like on Ed Gein, actual fantasies, and this is the first part of it, murder plan, okay? And I haven't even seen this, actually. I've never seen this. Joe Bob Briggs also thinks this is really interesting, too, you know? <laughs> the, uh, the, the nationally syndicated columnist that does horror, horror film, uh, no, drive-in, Joe Bob Briggs at the drive-in, you've never seen that? Well, you're not, obviously not into horror. But what, I, what I'm telling you is that when you go and take a man's rough drafts, this is, when you do a work, and this was to be a work, the ghoul, the person, all right, is a, is a commodity. He is a scary character. And when you read this, you get scared by the time you get to the end. You say, wow, is this a real guy? What, this guy could be around, you know? Like that, because this is what's really scary. King Kong isn't scary. Fuad Ramsey isn't scary. This is scary. Okay. Now, they went and they took these rough drafts and they stole it. Okay. What they got is they took. Oh, this looks good. This looks like it might be inculpatory to make him look like a serial killer. So we'll keep this one over here and we'll throw this part away. So by the, time, by the time the police got done with it, you got a piece over here, murder plan, which is nothing more than a little scenario. This is just a sketch to build something on. Sexual and I'm going to read this, and by the time I get it read and you get it cut, you're going to, it'll be turning into a, uh, a confession type of thing, is what it gets turned into, reading his work in, in a, uh, a setting where people understand that this is a reading, like a poetry reading or something. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. but. So many people have said, we think you're a killer because of that graphic stuff that you write. People have said this to me. They said, how can you write this kind of stuff and not be a killer? I said, well, you do it by research. You do it by concentration. You do it by creativity. I said, you do it the same way that everybody else who writes graphic murder stuff does it. You work at it. This isn't just something that happens. This is something that you pay money to go to the university to learn how to do it correctly. I mean, I went to, I graduated from uh, Florida Atlantic University and I took creative writing and I specialized in short stories. 
I did not specialize in doing novels or journalism. I specialized in short stories, and these are short stories. I've had so many bad experiences with, uh, with media and uh, police and everybody, you know, tricking me and saying, do this and do I've that. I've had so many bad experiences with, uh, with media and uh, police and everybody, you know, tricking me and saying, do this and do that, and you say it, and it comes back in a negative way. And I hope that by, by writing killer fiction that it is entertaining. Obviously, it's entertaining. A lot of people buy it. Uh, but I dislike it when people say, you, you created this work, therefore you're a killer. Or this proves that what the state is alleging, that you're a serial killer because you are capable of writing that. And that upsets me a great deal when people say that. Any, any judge or jury in their right mind? The state of Florida has submitted this part right here as proof to the federal judge that I committed those murders. It's in their, traver it's in their answer to my habeas corpus. They have put this piece in there and say, look, judge, this proves he killed them. It has nothing to do with, with that crime whatsoever. But you see, that is, their, that is their pitch, because they have nothing else. They have no proof that I did anything. They have this. Okay. Now, you want me to read it? I'll read it. And just, I'll just have to trust you to do the right thing. It's something that needs to be said, you know, this is an ongoing thing and, I, and I, I don't think that there's ever been a case like this in the entire judicial history of this country. This is an entirely unique case with the, with the lawyer and the wife and the book and, the, and there's no evidence that I am being convicted on the merit of my writing and this is wrong. If you've got something, if they've got anything right now, bring it and I'll plead guilty. But don't say because I went to school and I learned how to do this and do it excellently. Not half-assed. Not Herschel Gordon Lewis Fuad Ramsey's. This is the real thing, man. This is really scary. This is as good as anything Stephen King can put together. And I'm not doing it with vampires. I'm doing it with real live people that are walking around and you want to look. Oh boy, is it coming or not? You know? Let me see. Uh, that's Sondra. Not sending me. She should be sending me copies of this stuff if she's putting this together. All right, this deals with um, Into the Mind, uh, the, Into the Mind of the Ghoul. Now, the Ghoul is the, is the character that I created that was based on Fuad Ramsey's, written by uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. And uh, essentially, this character is a human monster, but he's a very believable human monster, and he, he functions very well in society, but when the moon is right, <laughs> this, the creature, the beast, comes out, and this was an attempt, into the mind of the ghoul, was an attempt by me as an artist, after reading about such people, real people, was an attempt by me to put together a mental picture of what this character would be like, if that's, under, if that's understandable. I wanted to have a mental profile of my character. And that's why, by the time you get to Paraline Road, you can see where this part is way down here on the left. Paraline Road is like a, uh, a culmination of how that mental process is. He is deteriorated into such a state as he is capable of doing the atrocities that are brought out in uh, Parallel Road. Now, uh, let's see, this part deals with uh, picking up a woman in a bar, I think. Okay, uh, the woman is by this time very frightened. This is good, because the more frightened she is, the greater the thrill for me. I tell her to strip, but I let her leave her underwear on. I tie her to a branch and gag her if she is too noisy while I go about the business at hand. And then I'm skipping to uh, another part, so there's a, a break here. I arrange the rope and the noose, and I dress the woman in the white shroud, place the pillowcase over her head, and then, if I feel like it, sit down and entertain her with a bit of my conversation. Terrorize her. 
give her my ideas on what she will look like while she's hanging there, fighting the rope that is slowly choking the life out of her. Make it as real as possible for her so that she is petrified with fear. Make her know that she is going to die. The noose is arranged so that she will strangle slowly, and she sits on a board between two limbs with a long rope leading off into the jungle. When it is time, I will go off into the jungle and pull the rope, and she will hang. Then I will go home and have something to eat, and bright and early the next morning I will be out hunting. I will find the body hanging from the tree, and only then will I really notice it, maybe fondle it, and maybe even have coitus with it. I will notice the expression on the face, the position of the body, explore every nick and cranny of her, perhaps mutilate her and delight in the smell of any urine or excrement that she may have passed while hanging there. I leave and then return, so it will be unbelievable to myself that I did the deed. I will not be able to remember doing it. Funny, isn't it? The deniability part and all that, which is based on serial killer studies, that you can see that I am that I'm putting together a serial killer person from a serial killer profile. To, it fits perfectly. But all of that is is research. I mean, that's going to the library and spending time studying uh, books about criminal mentality. Well, I think it's very valid. What's written is valid. And uh, the more they learn about serial killers, the more they see that this, this fits a lot of uh, what people do, especially the part that you mentioned about the deniability, right? This is pure Giles, Bernard Giles, when he would go out and kill them and leave and come back and, and screw the corpse. I'm sorry that people take it in a way that they feel that this is an expression of reality. This is fiction. This is make-believe. It's designed to scare you, okay? So I'm sorry that I wrote it and that people have misinterpreted what has been written and trying to say, no, this is not fiction, this is reality, because it's not reality, it's fiction. And it's just as valid fiction as anybody else who writes good scary stuff. That's scary. At least it scares me. <laughs> Doesn't it? Isn't it scary? Yeah. Okay. She may be revived before death, desirable, and subject, subjected to further indecencies. After death has occurred, the corpse should be violated, if not violated already. The body should then possibly be mutilated and carried to the grave and buried. All identity papers should be destroyed and the place of execution dismantled. This was supposed to be the perfect crime type of scenario that they would, that the ghoul would use in order to uh, remain unapprehended. They went out and they made a video after they, took my, after they took my stories, okay? And they read the stories. They went and got these girls from wherever they lived, up north in Michigan, I think it was, and brought them down here and used my stories to make a video. It was not, it was not a valid reenactment. Well, the address that it should have gone was my Fort Lauderdale address because that's where my car was registered. It was not registered in Martin County, which is 100 miles away from Fort Lauderdale. Yet, the testimony of this woman is that she copied down my license number, gave it to the police, the police ran the tag, and they gave her the Martin County address. It just is not true, see? And I could prove it wasn't true because I had it in my pocket and I gave it to Schwartz. I said, here's the document. She's not telling the truth find out who told her to tell this story. Somebody had to tell her, say this, lady. When they searched the home, they took my, my literary work, and they said, oh yes, this man writes lurid fiction, therefore he's a killer. But it had nothing whatsoever to do with those people who were killed. Nothing that belonged to the women who I am convicted of killing was found at any search. That is the myth, okay? Yes, we went to Schaefer's home. Yes, we conducted a search. Yes, we found this evidence that links him to this one and that one and the one he's convicted for. But when you get down to the facts, it does, that's a lie. There is nothing there. I am not linked to those people in any way except by the testimony of that woman that says, I copied down the license number, we checked it, and it went right to his home in Stewart. That's, that's the link. That's why it's so important. And when I gave the document to Schwartz and they changed it by trial time, it was showing that my car was registered to Stewart, where it never had been registered before. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's the connection. There's a lot of myth that goes on where they will tell you, like, 
yes, he's been in court 17 times. Yes, I've filed 17 times, and they just throw it out, see? Mm -hmm. And that, that leads you to believe that I've had judicial review under proper conditions where an inquiry has been made, but that has never been done until this time. That's why I was allowed in the federal court. The judge looked at it, he says, nobody has ever met, examined this stuff. What are you telling me? He's filed 17 times? Sure, yeah, sure he has. How come nobody ever looked at it? He keeps saying the same thing over and over. They framed me. That's what I'm saying to a whore. I mean, this is nothing new. Oh, yeah, ha, 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 ha. You think it's so funny? Well, we'll just tie you over here to this tree, and we'll tie you over to this tree, and I'll leave, and I'll bring somebody back and sell you. Well, I didn't. I, did, I tied them to the tree, but uh, I didn't go and get anybody and sell them. I just wanted to give them a scare. And, of course, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to impress on them the dangerousness of their situation, running around. They were nice kids, you know. I didn't want to see them end up in a ditch. And I was wrong, and I paid the price. And I pleaded guilty. I felt guilty. I gave them each a written apology. What else can I do, you know? <laughs> if I did something to you and I hurt you and, and caused you pain, then I have to say, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry I did it. And I am sorry, and I was sorry, and I apologized. I pled guilty, and that was the end of it. I fought. <laughs> it's, never, it's never the end of it. While you were working in which job? I was a, a deputy with Martin County when that happened. But see, they've tried to distort that. They've tried to say, well, that wasn't a legal arrest. And it was. It was a legal arrest. In fact, they sued. They went away. Okay. They sued the county for the, uh, I, I haven't seen a copy of the suit, but they did win a judgment against the county for what I did, which was abuse them while they were in my custody, legally in my custody. Not, I picked them up and drove them to a remote area and tried to rape them or anything like that often gets distorted, you know. No, because I, they, I had a responsibility to make sure that they were safe and taken, taken to the, uh, the jail and processed properly and returned to their parents. And when I made the arrest, it was my responsibility to make sure from, the, from point A to point B of the jail and nothing in between. And I fucked it up. I blew it. You know, it happens, right? <laughs> and uh, because of that, I have suffered enormously. I lost my career, went to jail, got a felony on my record, but there was no evil intent. The intent was to impress. We have three witnesses who have just given sworn affidavits that says that he did have a relationship, a sexual relationship with my wife before I was convicted. And he went into court and said he didn't. Now, who are you going to believe, him or the three people? Or are you going to say these three people are lying? They saw that personally. They witnessed Schwartz having sexual contact with my wife, romancing, uh, smooching in the back of a car. Uh, my sister and William Lane saw it approximately the same day, and then David Rogers saw it on a separate I day. I suppose Schwartz was thinking in terms of, well, this is 20 years ago, nobody's going to want to get involved in this anyway, and I'll just lie and get out of it. But uh, three people actually have given the affidavits. I think Sandra probably has copies of them. She'll give them to you. The, the judge in Palm Beach, Judge Payne, has to tell the magistrate to uh, issue an order to bring all the people together so that they can make the testimony. See, when Schwartz went down there, when we went down there last year at this time, Schwartz said, no, I never had a relationship with this man's wife until after he was in prison, which was a lie, all right? So then the three people came after he gave the testimony mm -hmm. and gave the affidavits. Now, that's new evidence that shows that the state's witness in chief is a perjurer, which is a felony. So. Schwartz has committed a felony before the United States District Court. So it's just not a question of a civil matter, it's a question of a criminal matter. And we have filed with the United States Attorney's Office in Miami, that's Dexter Langton, a criminal complaint against Schwartz. And they have taken this and they are doing their own investigation at this time. Has Schwartz, an officer of the court, committed perjury? And According to the three uh, affidavits, 
that is legally sufficient to prove the perjury. You need, in Florida law, you need two affidavits to prove a perjury. You just can't come in and say the man's lying. You need witnesses, mm -hmm. and they have to swear under oath. So now you have a choice. You have, you can believe Mr. Schwartz, or you can believe the three people who are filing under oath their own testimony saying, yes, he was having a sexual relationship with Schaefer's wife. Now, if these people are shown to be lying, then they are subject to perjury and five years in the joint for lying under uh, sworn affidavits. So you've got three swearing here and you've got one swearing there. Now they have to, uh, legally speaking, the court has to bring these people together and take the testimony and make a determination on who's telling the truth. And that will be up to the magistrate. And that's where we stand as to when they will be coming in and saying, testifying under oath and going up and being cross-examined, what did you see exactly? Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't there personally, so I don't know what they saw exactly. But they did see that he was having a sexual relationship with my wife before the trial started was the girlfriend of the trial judge, her name is Pat Quinna, and now it's Pat Quinna Trowbridge because she married him, came to me in the jail approximately August or September of 1973 and told me that my wife and my lawyer were having an affair and that I was going to be convicted and sent to prison. And I said, no, listen, I can prove because I have this document that shows that the state's witness in chief is lying. Mm -hmm. Those people were never in my car. They never copied down my license number because here is the proof. When you check a license tag, you know, and they put it in the computer, it comes back to the certain address. Well, the address that it should have come back to was in Fort Lauderdale if they had done it. But they never did that. See, they just said, "Yes, they we did it, said, and, and we yes, tracked we it, did it, and, and we home. tracked it to this in man's Stewart. home but in Stewart." But my car wasn't registered there. You drive up to my home, and I copy your license number down, and then I go to the police, and I say, "I copied this man's tag number down. Here's the tag number," and they run the tag through their computer. It's going to go to a certain address, right? Saying, and it was through the. Uh, miscegenations of my trial attorney who asked my wife to marry him right after I was convicted. Are you going to believe that there was nothing going on, that I was convicted and the same day I was convicted, hey, let's get married, Mrs. Schaefer. There was no romance? Come on, man, you know, give me a break, right? And then didn't tell me, oh, and she agreed to marry him. The trial attorney asked the wife of the defendant to marry him within 24 hours of the conviction and she agrees to it and there's no romance prior to the trial? You know, that's not even rational. You know, nobody does that. And then didn't even tell me about it for six, uh, how long was it? Almost, I guess, eight weeks. Never told me, I asked your wife to marry me and she agreed to marry me and uh, the relationship here has changed. You know, I wasn't told for two months that this even was going on after I was convicted, much less before I was it convicted. Was the only person who told me about it before I was convicted was And uh, they were the runaways. Everything was on, everything was proper and done according to the book, except I wanted to give them a scare. They laughed. They thought it was a joke. Well, according, because of the Son of Sam law, I'm not allowed to discuss that with the media. Eventually, I, I made a legal, a legal arrest and I abused the prisoners. They were not raped or sexually assaulted or anything like that. I told them that they were leaving themselves open to be murdered, uh, abused, and all that, running away with no money, and no visible means of support. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna make a living? And they just laughed, you know? You're gonna sell drugs, you're gonna sell pussy, what are you gonna do? You gotta put, put food in your mouth. And I said, well, they, they, ha, 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 you know, we'll just get along. I said, yeah, you'll get along, you'll wind up in a ditch, you know, in my jurisdiction, and then I'll have to pick up the pieces. And I said, show you how easy it would be, you know. Here you are under arrest. I know a guy who buy a young girl. Hell, uh, I know five or six of them that would buy a young girl and make her, make her